Welcome to Computer Networks. This is Lecture 17. Homework 8 is due this week. Who finished Homework 8? Who started Homework 8? Okay. What did you find out so far? What do you want to, what do you would like to share about Homework 8? Um, it felt like the main part was swimming uh, towards the right. Okay. Because otherwise, it just seemed that would be grab it from the routing table once, and with almost no pain, just dump it out the door every, on every link. Yeah, you need to add one, though, right? Yeah. To the cost. Yeah, you have to add five. Yeah. That's not, yeah. it's not a big pain to make. But just otherwise, you have to go in and say, okay, who am I sending this to? And I need to adjust, you know, is this a route I got from them? And then go in and adjust the key yeah. change into it. Yeah, so the tricky thing might be to do split horizon <coughs> in this homework. Any, anything else? Anybody? Anybody else? Okay. All right. We're going to talk about homework eight actually in a little bit more detail. Homework nine is out. Who got a chance to at least uh, look at it? Anyone? Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty simple. This one requires almost no programming. You should be able to do it without programming, I think. Uh, but if you want to make your life easier, I think programming will will help. And. We have a lot of slots for student presentations. If you're interested in presenting a topic, please come talk to me. I'll actually suggest a few topics at the end of this lecture as well. Before we get started, I just wanted to share this output. So does everyone output of uh, dig command? Does, do people recognize the command at the top? You all know what that is, right? So I, wa I wanted to, I wanted you to look at the authority section. What is authority section? What does it tell you? Which name servers uh, are allowed to answer questions related to a particular name? The name that we're concerned about here is uh.edu. Look at the last authority. So the first three authorities, it makes sense. It seems like these are servers uh, within uh.edu. What about the last one? So those of you who have laptops, can you look up you know, what that organization is, wki.edu? Yeah, so what's going on? Why is the University of Kentucky an authority for uh.edu? Any ideas? Yeah, it's, it's a backup. It's a backup authority. And I was curious about this, and I asked the IT department what's going on, and they said, yes, uh, it's a backup. And they're planning to remove this uh, because they now have a different way of ensuring there are redundant name servers. So I thought I would just share that. So homework eight, the tricky part is going to be implementing split horizon as we just discussed a minute ago. And before we do split horizon, we need to come up with a way to first demonstrate the problem. And the problem that we're trying to solve using split horizon is count to infinity. So I want you to look at uh, this topology on the slide and, and tell me if that's a good enough topology to study the count infinity problem. Is that a good enough topology? It is? OK. If it is a good enough topology, how do we trigger count to infinity? So take down the linked incident there. So what I'm going to do now is draw this topology on the whiteboard, and we're going to try to run the routers using this topology and see what happens, OK?
We're going to try to implement that router in in, in the code, basically. So let's. Uh, Can everyone see the writing up there? That's good. All right. All right, let's let me see. So first, uh, let's just uh, remove all the link files, um, write files. Uh, let's first build the topology. So link one. What are the entries here? What should I type? Two. Right. Oh, it should be two zero. It should be all twenty. Right. Those are the those are the ports that we have. So that's what we put. Two zero. Two o two. Right. What's the second link? Three. Two, three. Right. We don't need this. And link two. What should I type here? Two zero. Two one. Right. It should be node one zero zero one. Right. What else? What are the entries here? Start with one, two, zero, two, one. Is that right? What else? Two, 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 four. four. Okay. Now link four. What are the entries? Three, two, zero. Okay, great. So I believe my code actually requires, even if it is empty, a route file. So we're gonna let's let's see if that's true or not. So uh, yeah, so we're gonna have a dot out just like last time. So bad habit. So how do I launch? Let's say node number one. One. Yeah, it's it's looking for a route file, right? So we're gonna create route file. Seems like it's up. Let's take it. Yeah. So that's going to be our node one. How do I launch node two? Like that? Okay, let's make sure. Yeah. So that's our node two. Oh, so guys, what's going on? Let's make sure those up node nodes one and two are already right talking next to each other. So let's see what's going on here. So <coughs> node two knows about two destinations. Uh, destination two, which is itself. Zero and destination one cost one next up one, so that makes sense, right? All right. So 
here. Let's look at, let's launch another node. Auto launch mode, same. Is getting slow. <laughs> All right, that's node three. How many interfaces does three have, or how many neighbors? There should be three of them. Okay, so makes sense. One, two, four. Great. Like there's something wrong with our topology file. Oh, is that what I did? I see. <coughs> Maybe <coughs> two zero two zero. Oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay, that was about to get a zero on this assignment. <laughs> okay, so let's launch the fourth node. Which node do we need to launch now? Four, okay. Four, two, zero, two, zero, four. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's uh, let the routers discover the routes. Seems like node four already knows about all the nodes in the network. I think now all the nodes know about all the nodes in the network, right? Okay, so what are the costs from, let's say, let's Look at the path to node four. What's the cost from node two? Two, and that makes sense, right? So what's the next stop right now from node two to four? Next stop is three. Okay, that, that also makes sense. All right. Okay, so now what we're going to do is break the link three, four. How do we do that? Yeah, so we just uh, go, this is node three, right? We just say down three, I think. Yeah, oh, four. four, okay. All right, so the interfaces are there, but uh, I think, um, and we should also say down three. So that we no longer receive beacons from node four. So let's see what happens now. So we just brought the link down three four. Right? So four is not going to receive any messages from three because we said down four on node three, and three is not going to receive any beacons from node four because we said down four or down three on node four. So what's happening to the cost? to node four. Okay, um, see destination uh, four. Do you see do you see the cost going up? Why is the cost going up? Yeah. Exactly. That's what's happening. So I'm gonna break this and uh, then just describe exactly what's going on and then we'll move on. I think the network is uh, pretty bad, so I'm not getting accurate numbers. So 
the cost really started at 1 for node 3, right? If we scroll up, I think we can see that. So the cost was 1 for a while, but the A's kept on going up. Why is that? because node 3 is no longer receiving beacons from node 4. So even though it has an entry, it has not been refreshed for a while. So that's why the A's, uh, it keeps on going up. It went from 2 to 3, and at some point, it got so old that we had to expire that entry. So it's an expiring 4. You see that? So what happens once the entry is expired? It's going to receive a beacon either from node 1 or node 2, in this case from node 2, right? And what is that beacon going to say about path to node 4? It's going to say there is a path to node 4 at the cost of 2. Right? And that's what happened if you look at this entry. It says destination 4, cost is 3, and the next hop is 2. So if you want to understand and experiment with count to infinity problem, that's probably a pretty good topology, a small one to experiment with. Any questions? Those of you who did not manage to get forwarding to work cleanly, we will just uh, evaluate your routing protocol by looking at the routes. Do you guys know the command to look at the routes? I think it's just R. This is one of the commands that you're supposed to implement on the terminal. Any questions? All right. So, looks like we're in good shape. And split horizon is one of the techniques you can use to prevent count to infinity from happening in your network. So this is a log file. Yes. Yeah, please continue to use the log files. Um, maybe we should do that because it seems like at least some of us were not able to get forwarding to work correctly. But yeah, we don't need to do that. You can, you're welcome to add new entries to the log file if you want. But we're not going to require that because we're just going to look at the routing table. Does that make sense? I think that's a, that's a reasonable thing to do. Yeah. But the printout messages are not going to be very standard, right? That's why, that's the reason, uh, rather than looking at a bunch of print, print apps, we're just going to look at, you know, what, what your program displays when we type R into the terminal. And if you want sort of a standard uh, way to print the routing table, you can go look at this video and you can try to print it the same way, although that's not a requirement. It just has to be obvious to us uh, what the next stop is, what the cost is, what the age is, and what, what the destination is. So we don't is. need to reprint the routing table? Um, yeah, you don't need to do, uh, reprint the routing table. Um, but it might be useful for debugging. Right? But we're just going to type R into the terminal and see, see what it displays. And if you want to know the specific way in, in which it should be printed, you can look uh, at the video for an example, but that's not a requirement. It just has to be obvious, those key pieces of information. Any other question? All right. So we're going to talk about a few. Uh, we're going to wrap up BGP, uh, talking about BGP regis and a few other topics to wrap up the networking layer. So let's uh, think about um, how we select, uh, we, we prefer to select routes in BGP. We typically prefer routes from customers. Why is that? Why do we prefer routes from customers? Because the customer is paying us for these links, so I mean, if we can actually use that without, while earning money, that's that's even better, right? And uh, we also prefer shorter paths, typically. 
Uh, it turns out if we use policy such as this, we can end up in a situation in which there are multiple stable configurations. And one of the stable configurations is something that we don't desire. And that's a problem. If the protocol converges on a route and it's perfectly stable, but that's not the configuration we want, that's a problem. Right? So here's one example. Let's imagine we have a topology that looks like what we show on the slide. The circles are autonomous systems. The numbers inside the circles, those are autonomous system numbers. We have, for autonomous system one, two upstream ISPs, two and five. And then they have you know, their ISPs three and four, and these are, let's say, tier one ISPs, and they peer with each other. Right? So that's the topology we have. And why might uh, um, this autonomous system one want to be a customer of two different ISPs? It's the backup links. Let's say one of the ISPs goes down, you still want to have connectivity to the internet. Right? So that's why we have two ISPs uh, that are providers for autonomous system one. And whenever we have this kind of multi-homed network, we uh, would like to designate one of the links as primary links and the other one as secondary. Right? So in this case, what's the primary link? It's one five. Five is our you know, default provider, primary provider. And whenever five goes down, or the link between one and five goes down, we would like to use uh, two as our backup provider. So this is how most of the traffic, uh, uh, this, is how, this is what the paths are going to look like in a normal case, which is exactly what we desire. Right? For example, uh, there are a bunch of customers of ISP2 that need to send a packet to one of the IP addresses inside autonomous system one, what is the path those packets should follow? Uh, two, one directly? No, right? We, we, don't, we don't want to use that to the extent possible. We want to use that only when um, there is a problem in the topology. So let's say the primary link breaks. Any question about the topology? And how, how might we implement this kind of topology in terms of route advertisements? Because one will have to tell both the ISPs that, okay, here's the, I'm available, these are the IP addresses that are available within me, right, within my autonomous system. If the ISPs are using, as we said in the earlier slide, let's say, shortest path, we prefer routes through customers over peers, and we also prefer shortest paths. The path to one is actually short. How do we actually force the protocol to select two, three, four, five, one instead of two, one? Turns out you can just add the autonomous system number multiple times. So instead of uh, advertising just two, one, you could say two, one, 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 many times, and that path looks like a long, long path. And these autonomous systems, they are forced to select two, three, four, five, one. Does that make sense? Okay, so now we know how to set up the primary path and the backup path if we were in this kind of situation. Now let's imagine this link breaks. What happens next? So at some point, five is going to realize that this link uh, is no longer available. Then what should five do? It should withdraw the route. Right? So it's, it's no longer available, the BGP session has gone down. And this is exactly what we want uh, BZP to do. This, this link broke down, so somehow this has to be advertised to the rest of the routers in the internet so that we start using the backup path. So once five starts the withdrawal process, and let's say this process, uh, th these messages propagate across the network from each respective routers, we end up with routes that look like that we show on the slide. And this is exactly what we want to happen. Now let's say this link comes back up. 
this 915 comes back up after some time. What is the desired behavior in that case? Yeah. So in this particular case, though, even though 5 discovers this sort of path and starts advertising it, it turns out the path from autonomous systems 3 and 2 will not change. Are you convinced that's the case? Why is that? So it turns out 3 and 2 will continue to use the backup route, even though the primary link is up. And the reason is, think from uh, 3's perspective. So one of, the link, one of the links is a peer link, and the other link is a customer link. So it has two different ways of sending packets to this particular network. And what, is a, what does an ISP prefer to use? If there are two different links to a particular destination and one is a peer link and one is a customer link, use the customer link. Right? Because you're getting paid and you're, and you're, you're able to now use, use that link, so why not? Right? How about four? Thinks the same way, and it's also a shorter route, so so it actually makes sense that it's going to use four, five, one. How about two? Yeah, so three is not even advertising that at all. So are you convinced that this is another stable configuration? So what do we do? So this is a problem. We we wanted uh, this route to be this. Uh, link one, two to be a backup link to the internet, and now we're using it all the time. It might be because this might be a link that does not have a lot of capacity. Because this is a backup link, you're not going to provision backup link in some cases exactly the way you provision the primary link, right? So how do we solve this problem? Yeah, so one of the solutions is to actually break the link, one, two, deliberately. And when you break that link, what happens? Let's uh, think from three's perspective. It says there's no route. There, there's no route three, two, one. So three is now forced to use three, four. Right? And how about node two? Yeah, forced to use two, three, four, five, one. And we're back in the configuration that we wanted. Right. Any questions? Okay. So it's actually a tricky thing to do. To have, for example, to configure BGP with primary and backup path. And not just that, configuring BGP in general are very in general it's a, it's a very tricky thing to do. And one of the configuration errors that we talked about last time originated from um, the complexity that are sometimes uh, hard to guess and sometimes complexity due to how the protocol interacts in a distributed setting. Do you remember the configuration error that we talked about last time? How did the YouTube error occur? Yeah, to, to the entire internet, right? That's, that's what they did. So that's a, that's a configuration error. I don't think it was their intention to capture all the pack, you know, packets destined to YouTube from the entire world to them. I don't think that was their intention. What they wanted to do was capture all the packets that, uh, that would uh, be used by the users within. That, that was their goal. Last time we also talked about some of the other ways in which you could compromise the routing system. For example, somebody who is not authorized to announce a particular set of IP addresses, for example, might announce that 
there is a path to those IP addresses through, through, through that particular router. Do, do you remember that problem? Right. So how do we solve that uh, kind of problem? Do we need, uh, that, that seems like a huge security risk that anyone on the internet can just say, you know, I know how to send packets to destination X, Y, Z. How do we solve that problem? Any, any suggestions? Okay, what is that? It's a service uh, that guy was worried about that happening in the future. Yeah. He wrote uh, a little program that goes and uh, will check all of his IPs yeah. uh, on write, which is the service that checks routes to UDP yeah. servers uh, from a bunch of different things all over the world. Yeah. And it would send him an email if uh, his route suddenly started Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was, and he mentioned that he added to some other people and they expressed interest and he basically now makes a living selling this uh, software. Mm -hmm. So basically, one of the solutions would be to try to uh, verify the claims that are in the packet. And what is the, the claim is basically, I know how to route to these IP addresses, right? So you can try to validate those claims by actually verifying that those IP addresses exist, and you can do that by looking at various databases that are maintained uh, that tell you, okay, this organization um, has these IP addresses and so forth. So I think that's a, that's a reasonable way to get started. Any, any other ideas on how we might solve this problem? It comes down to verification. Someone claims, okay, I have this particular IP address, or I know how to send packets to these IP addresses. So it comes down to, you know, how do we verify that claim? Um, we won't go through the details, but you can look at the slides. Uh, here's another way to um, solve this uh, problem to some extent. But one of the problems with all of these approaches is it's really hard to deploy these systems incrementally. Right? Because you, you want the whole infrastructure to work in a particular way uh, for the system to work. Let's say we built this protocol that verifies that someone, uh, when, when they claim they have this IP address, that they are the actual owners. Then we want all of the owners to sign up for this system. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to verify everyone. right? Think about, let's say, ID cards. Uh, Unless we decide to give everyone here these ID cards that are authenticated, uh, that system is not going to work, right? Let's say only 10% of the students who decide to get ID cards, then I can't use those ID cards uh, to secure a facility because 90% of the students, they don't have ID cards, but they still need access to these facilities. So that's one of the challenges of deploying some of these protocols and systems that verify ownership. Uh, Double system that tried to use both, and when it can't use the authenticated system, mm -hmm. it prefers mm -hmm. data it gets from that. But if that isn't available, then you could go with the SSL. Yeah, you could you could do that. Uh, for example, the way voter registration works, in, in many voting systems, you're allowed to register on the site. Right? Of course, that's going to be a little bit of trouble as a voter. So it's in your interest to actually be a part of the system that authenticates voters ahead of time. Uh, similarly, as you suggested, uh, even though we have incremental deployment, first of all, first try to verify that you're a legitimate owner of these addresses or this route that, uh, that you're able to route to these addresses in the secure system. And if there is no information there to suggest that you're able to do this, then maybe you fall back to the regular system. Then what's the incentive for someone to actually implement this if there is a fallback? Let's say I'm a bad guy, and I'm going to claim that I have I can route packets to X, Y, Z, and of course I'm not going to be in the secure system. Now the system falls back to trusting me, trusting my announcements. Well, there's no incentive for the bad guy to do that. But the yeah. good guys, that at least helps them identify other good guys. Yeah. So now, what's the incentive for the good guys to actually implement this? 
distance by that. There, traffic there handling is less likely to be hijacked. Yes. Yes. So the traffic there handling is going to be less likely to be hijacked. But if you think about BGP policies, could you actually institute a policy in BGP to really incentivize the good guys to implement these kind of measures? So what does your policy say? Policy says uh, if we receive multiple routes to a given destination, we're going to use this route. So what can we? So we, we can actually tweak the policy, right? Saying so we're going to always prefer policies. Oh, or yeah. you would prefer a policy that's not complicated. Yeah, exactly. And so the incentive, the incentive is incentive to authenticate yourself is to make it harder for other people to steal right. your route. Yeah, exactly. So so we could do that. You know, the uh, policy level. All right. Let's think about data plane attacks. So we've been talking about control plane attacks. Well, what is control plane? Routing. Routing, basically. OK. So the, the security vulnerabilities that we've been talking about until now, they're all about you know, compromising the uh, process of finding the routes. Let's th think about data plane. Data plane is basically forwarding the packets. Once you know the route, you forward the packets. It's basically what you're doing in homework eight. So homework seven. In homework seven, we assume we already knew the routes, right? So what are some of the data plane attacks? Let's say someone, some router is reading all the packets, stealing information from the packets. That's that's one type of attack, right? I think that's called the snooping attack. How about you just slowing down the traffic? You could also do that. That's a type of data plane attack. Right. We already know the we already know the routes. Now we're just trying to forward the packets. But what are the kinds of things that some router could do to the packets that are in transit? It turns out it's actually quite difficult to detect data plane attacks, just like some control plane attacks. Let's say there's a router that is intentionally slowing down your packets. How can you detect that? Because so some of these might be not attacks, but policy. For example, let's say you provide a service, and there is a competitor that also provides the same kind of service, then you might want to slow down the traffic that goes to the competitor to make the customers think that the competitor provides a low quality service and hopefully they will switch to your service. So you might want to be able to, in that particular case, slow down the traffic that goes to your competitor. But how do you detect this is happening? How can you do this, the, this router is slowing down all the traffic going to the competitor? Any ideas? You could you could measure latency, which we're going to do in the next homework. The next next homework, actually. Have you used a tool called Ping? What does uh, what does it tell you? It says you know this many packets sent, this many packets received. It also tells you how long it took to get the reply back. So that gives you a measure of latency, right? But if they're slowing down everything? But what if they're only slowing down the traffic going to the competitor's site or server? The ping is just going to say it's taking much longer than expected. Right? It's, it's taking five seconds for the packets to go through. But how do you know that's because of the slowdown that is introduced at the router versus congestion is in the upstream links? Wouldn't there be a large difference in latency if you pinged it from a predictive machine and from something that wasn't um, being dictated? Yeah. So if there are alternate paths, maybe you could do this kind of analysis. But let's say this uh, service exists as a stub autonomous system. It only has, let's say, one uh, ISP. It would be pretty challenging. What's that? Just go over there and ask them. Go over and ask them if. Much of this latency 
due to network or processing delay? It could be processing delay too. Just for the competitor's server. Yeah. But, uh, but if all it makes the a different path, then you can't really. Yeah. If it just you happen to find a different path, that's yeah. that's better. Yeah. So if it is a different path, you can try to disambiguate if it is processing delay or networking related delay. Does that make sense? Because sometimes the server itself might be slow. Yeah. Right. So maybe that you can try to understand. So this is a pretty hard problem. I just wanted you to get an appreciation for that. Um, but it's uh, harder to it's harder to pull that off. Why is that? Because you have to do you have to actually own the router. You have to have access well, to the you router. Have to, you have to put a custom custom code in the router. Custom code onto it because yeah. presumably Cisco and Juniper and people like that don't ship their routers with this kind of thing. Yeah, and also you have to thing. yeah you have to have a pretty good control of the core routers and they're they're usually secure. Some of the control plane attacks, you could just connect a router or a peer to some ISP and start to propagate information. But this, you actually have to change the forwarding logic. Right. Okay. All right. So hopefully you appreciate that uh, there are some security issues in the control plane as well as the data plane. And a lot of times, it's hard to detect them. Uh, let, let, alone, let alone in designing systems that would uh, that would actually prevent some of these issues. All right. This is a slide that we used last time to talk about IP address aggregation. So what we're going to do is just touch on briefly the IP service model and the IP addresses and what they are. All right. So IP provides basically two functionalities. And again, we got to learn about this functionality in homework seven to some extent in an abstract manner first. Right? Uh, the first is addressing, which is a way to give a unique name to each host connected to the network. That, that's what addressing is. And the second is forwarding, given a destination, what is the link on which you should transmit a packet, right? And it's not routing. Um, this is maybe the third or fourth time we've mentioned this. Forwarding is not routing. OK. The service model used in IP is a best effort delivery. IP does not try very hard to deliver the packet reliably. Why is that OK? Don't we want our packets to be reliably delivered? Why is that OK? Yeah, so we have other services that build on this that provide reliable service. But there's another reason why you probably don't want to build reliability uh, in IP. And that's because there are other ways in which we want to use network that doesn't require a high degree of reliability. And if the only way to use the network is to have high reliability, then we won't be able to use services that don't require reliability, or it'll be, uh, there'll be a lot of overhead that you pay to reliably deliver the packets, even though we might not be interested in reliably delivering all the packets all the time. So to allow that possibility, the IP service model only provides for best effort delivery. In the beginning, TCP and IP were built as a single protocol. But later, they were split precisely for this reason. You might also deliver duplicate packets sometimes. The IP itself uh, does not try to do, uh, does not try to eliminate the duplicates. TCP or UDP will have to do that. or other transfer protocols that you might build on top of IP. Here's what the packet header looks like. 
all the details, uh, you know, we don't really need to try to memorize them, but let's look at a few fields. When you send a packet to a given destination, you're supposed to put in the packet what is the destination. This is similar to what our packets look like in homework seven, right? We have to put in the packet what is the destination. So why do you need to put it there? Because on each hub, we need to know how to forward the packet. And also, the destination needs to know that that's the destination. So we need that. Why, why do we need source IP address or source address? Why do we need that? Yeah, so in case you need to return messages in response to this packet received, then we need to know where to send the packet. Right? And when we originate this response packet, we might actually grab the source IP address and then put that as the destination IP address where we want to send a reply. How about TTL? TTL stands for time to live. This is similar to the hop count field that we have in our assignment. Why do we need this kind of field? Why do we need hop count? Yeah, so the packets don't get stuck in a loop. And why is solving count to infinity problem not enough? Why do we need this? Because we're talking about data plane now, right? So even though we have designed our routing system to uh, minimize the time uh, there is a loop in the network during the transition there might still be some times when there is a loop and if we happen to send a packet during that time the packet is going to go around the loop many times and we don't want that so we have TTL how about protocol why do we need something called protocol So UDP is built on top of IP, usually, right? How about TCP? IP. So when the destination, let's say, receives a packet, yeah, it needs to know how to interpret it. So should it hand it over to the program that accepts UDP, or should it hand this packet over to the program that is going to process TCP packets? So TCP So those are some of the fields. And after all of these header fields, we have the actual payload. And this is similar to the packets that we have in our homework as well. All right. There's some other fields. Let's not worry about that. Sometimes the packet that you want to send is much larger than the maximum packet size allowed by the network. What do we do in that case? Break it up. Break it up, yeah, exactly. So that's called fragmentation. So if you have a packet that's not going to fit in just one packet, if you have data that's not going to fit in one packet, we break it up <coughs> in multiple packets. Now, if we break it up like this, for example, the second link, or the link between R2 and R3 does not accommodate large packets. We still have 1,400 bytes to send, but it does not accommodate large packets like that. In which case, it's going to break it, break it up into three different packets. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to we're going to talk about that. So you basically have to reproduce the header first of all, but you also need to do something additional. And what is that? So you have to first of all mark that it, it has been fragmented. And what information do you need when you assemble these fragments into a single packet? Order. Yeah, in which order, right? So which is what is shown here. You replicate the header. Uh, for example, identification of that packet is X. So that's the packet identified with the sequence number or something like that. But there is an offset field in the set of fragments because there is no guarantee that we are going to receive these fragments in the order they were transmitted because they might take different paths, some packets might get dropped, retransmitted, etc. So you need to look at the offset field. This tells you the order in which you put together the original payload. 
Any questions? Yeah, what if the last packet gets lost? Mm -hmm. So there is this uh, more fragments bit. So if you have that bit, you should be able to solve that problem. Can you imagine how? So the last, all the fragments of the last packet is going to have this bit set. Yeah. So let's say the last packet is dropped. Then you did not receive a packet of a particular type. What is that? It's, it's a particular. Yeah, so you didn't receive a fragment with this bit set to zero. Right? Is that clear? Yeah. All right, so I think, yeah, I think let, let, let's cover this protocol uh, briefly. Who has heard of ICMP and actually used it? I think everyone, everyone has used this actually. Uh, maybe not directly, but using a different program sometimes. So this is a protocol that is typically used to report error messages in the internet. Whenever there is an error, different hosts, they need to communicate that to each other, and this is a protocol that is typically used. You have definitely used the ping command, which actually uses protocol. Sometimes um, when you're doing fragmentation and let's say the reassembly was, uh, re reassembly failed. This is, this is an error message, right? So you can use this protocol to communicate. This is what the packet header looks like. The only reason to show this is to, I'll do that, okay, this looks like any other packet header. We should be able to write programs to send these packets or to receive and process these packets. It's just like any other he headers. The type of error, type of code, and the checksum for the message itself. Trace route, if you've used it already, actually uses ICMP to discover all the hops in the path to the destination. And this is going to be one of the student presentation topics uh, for, for future classes. So if you're interested in presenting this topic, how, how, the, how, how Traceroute works, uh, please come talk to me. Okay? And finally, uh, remember we said that when we send a packet to the destination, we, what do we put in the IP header? The destination IP address. But within a local network, it's the data link address that is used to send packets, MAC address. Right. So there has to be a way to convert or look up the MAC address corresponding to an IP address when the packet reaches the destination. Does everyone understand this problem? So on a local area network, once a packet reaches a destination, uh, we, can't, we can't really address those hosts using IP address. We need to know the physical layer address, for example. Yeah, if there's not a filter. Why, why would that cause a problem? Yeah, that's right. So there, in some circumstances, this might not work, but this is, this is the way in which you can address the same node using a different address, and there might be various reasons why you might want to do that. And one of them is, okay, you have a packet that you just received for destination A, and this node is supposed to be here in this network. And in that case, you need a mechanism that allows you to discover the MAC address for a given IP address. And this is a protocol that is typically used. You can imagine how this protocol might work if you had to design it. Uh, you can send a broadcast to your network saying, who has this particular IP address? Okay. And one of those nodes is going to have that particular IP address, and that node is going to reply saying, okay, I have that IP address, and here is my MAC address. Now you know the mapping between IP address and MAC address. Right? And next time, 
you receive a packet with that destination, you know the MAC address to which you should transmit that packet. So does everyone understand the basic mechanism and the purpose of this protocol? And you don't need to you know, worry about the details, but this is what uh, the frame would look like. And finally, uh, about the IP addresses themselves. So we're all familiar with this notation where we put some numbers with dots in between. I think we're all familiar with that. Right? That's just a convenient way of uh, writing and communicating about IP addresses. IP addresses are just numbers. They're just 32-bit numbers. The only reason why we do these dots is, it turns out, it, that makes it easier to um, communicate, at least uh, with humans, um, about uh, the groups of addresses or the destinations or the sources and so forth. Also makes it easier to remember, doesn't it? If it's something that, something that, something that, something versus a large number. So the forwarding tables are keyed by network portion, not the entire address. Why is that? Because there's an assumption that a given network will have a set of IP addresses that are close to each other in the address space. So it's possible to aggregate them into what is called a network address, which is basically the first set of bits in the IP address. And the reason this is desirable is it can reduce the size of forwarding table. So rather than list all of the addresses that are within 212.31.32. starting zero all the way to 255, that would be a lot of entries, 256 entries. If all those IP addresses uh, can be uh, are available in a local address, for example, I think 0.0.0.0 means uh, default route. Uh, why not just to have one entry? That's clearly efficient in terms of amount of uh, RAM you need, right? Uh, traditionally, these addresses were divided into different classes of addresses depending on the number of IP addresses in that particular network. For example, a class C address would have 255 different addresses. So you would go to this authority and say, okay, I'm, I have, I don't know, 20 or 30 uh, machines. I need to connect to the internet. And the authority would say, okay, here's a class C address that you can use. But there's, a, there's an inefficiency with that kind of allocation. Let's say I had 500 machines. Then I would need a class B address, causing a huge inefficiency. And that's one of the reasons why we ran out of IPv4 addresses sooner than we should have. Right? Because this type of allocation is inherently inefficient. Because you can either have a block that has 255 or 6, or 65,535 addresses. Or even larger class A addresses. So what's the, what's the solution to this? this problem. Make the address longer, that would be one solution. Another uh, solution would be to uh, make this address, uh, do, do this address allocation uh, at a finer uh, granularity. Not, okay, either the last eight bits or you know, 16 bits, but allow finer granularity in the, um, in, in the allocation. And I will give you an example for that. So rather than say, we're going to give you a network address that has the first, let's say, 24 bits or 16 bits set, give the flexibility to give the flexibility to have, let's say, instead of eight, maybe nine bits, or even let's say seven bits or six bits. Oh, sorry, I meant uh, normally class C would be 24 bits are fixed. Right? 
And let's say you just need a little bit more than 255 IP addresses. The traditional solution is to give you a slash 16 address, class B address. But you don't, you don't need all those IP addresses. So you just, you just allocate a, a network address that has just a shorter network name. Instead of, let's say, 24, you might have 23 bits of network address. So how many IP addresses do you have in a 23-bit network address compared to a 24-bit network address? Twice. Twice as many, right? And that might be enough. Does that make sense? And if you use this principle, then you start expressing IP addresses uh, with two parts. One is the address, and then you'll say slash, and the number of bits and the name of the network. For example, 18 slash 8. What does that mean? And that basically represents all the IP addresses that have the number 18 as the first eight bits. But you have a lot of flexibility. Traditionally, you would allocate slash 8, slash 16, or slash 24. Right, class A, class B, class C, but now you can start allocating class 17. So let's say I'm an ISP with that particular uh, allocation, 128.148 slash 16, then I could actually start allocating the slash 17. Does that make sense? And how are IP addresses allocated? There's an organization that does that. ICANN is an organization that will tell the regional registries, okay, here are the different IP addresses that are available, and those regional registries are going to allocate them to various organizations. 